Good morning. I could not be more excited to be introducing our speaker, Kai D. Wright, today. As we get started, uh, for all of your questions, please drop them in the comments section to the right side of your screen. A little bit about Kai. Kai is a lecturer at Columbia University and a global consulting partner at Ogilvy. He is a leading expert on building culturally fluent, change-resilient organizations. He works with executives, celebrities, and founders to grow their brands. He was named to the 30 under 30 lists for Forbes and Adweek, in addition to receiving the highest honors from the Advertising Research Foundation. His latest book, which you'll share with us today, Follow the Feeling, Brand Building in a Noisy World. Uh, the book was recognized by Goodreads as a must-have resource for anyone from C-suite executives to aspiring entrepreneurs seeking to unleash the full potential of their brand. He is a vocal advocate for racial justice and curated the Blacklist 100, which highlights change agents and thought leaders for the Black community. Please join me in welcoming Kai. Hi, Fizz. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to join you. Of course. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see your face, and I'm so happy we're finally doing this. Absolutely. And your shirt reminds me, of course, of the quintessential New York in transit. I know we're all missing travel right now. And so we're going to hopefully have a really great session and mentally teleport some individuals to a, a better space and time. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan to me. Sounds like a good plan to me. Let's get started then. Um, you know, we'll talk a lot about your book, but before jumping into that, I'd like to give the audience an insight into how your ideas come about. Uh, let's peek into the perspective behind your thought leadership by discussing your childhood. You, know, you often describe yourself as an intellectual outcast. What do you mean by that? And how did your upbringing influence how you ideate today? Yeah, you know, that's a great question in terms of where that muscle comes from to exercise strategy. I think it comes from being what I call an American foreigner. I was born in the U.S. My parents, both of them were in the army. That's where they met. And we very quickly moved to Germany after I was born. And so I came back to the U.S. Um, just for kindergarten when I was five. And so I learned a lot of different skills that I think children typically don't when they grow up in a foreign environment, surrounded by multiple languages. We know that in Europe, individuals speak on average um, a couple of languages, which is you know more than the average one that Americans speak. And so I learned how to ask great questions and how to observe people. And those are two skills that have benefited me significantly as I grew older. Um, you know, some of the things that I think it unlocked was this interest in STEM before STEM became incredibly popular. Um, I loved observation and conducting experiments a lot. And so I did science fair projects and I did that from ninth grade until 12th grade. And that really gave me a foundation for how to conduct research how to control different variables, how to um, develop different hypotheses, and then how to revalidate results and be okay with the notion of failing at first, but committing to fail forward at least. And I was pretty good fizz in, in science. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I made it almost, uh, I was one seat away from going to the Intel International Science Fair my wow. senior year um, and I won first in the state of Florida for my category and so this close and I probably would have had a very different career doing something in, in science or engineering um, profession but I chose creativity. <laughs> well hey things worked out things worked out pretty well for you Mr. Forbes 30 under 30. <laughs> <laughs> well hey it's a super insightful very relatable thanks for sharing that. And I'm sure that these are a lot of great skills that you've picked up that helped you now as a marketer, uh, as a creative, and as an educator. Now, I've heard you say that as an educator, you strive to make complex issues so, so radically simple that they fit into uh, the back of a napkin. Now, keeping that in mind, tell us the story of how your book, Follow the Feeling, came into being. Uh, you know, Give us a long origin story, but also, if you can, 
the core back of the napkin idea. Sure, absolutely. So I'm going to start by just telling you about my process. And I want to take it back to um, Emily Wapnick, who is a career coach. She has a really great TED talk that I encourage everyone to watch. That's around multi-potential lights, polymaths, or individuals that are good at doing more than one thing. Individuals who are bound to have this kind of nomadic experience as they become professionals. And so I always knew that I had this sense of being good at different things. I always loved science. I loved math. I love creative arts also. And so when I left college, I really wanted to make sure that I was being fulfilled in all those different areas. I studied behavioral economics. And so the book is rooted in behavioral economics and behavioral science. And um, it's been a, an interest of mine just from an academic standpoint for the past 10 years from a graduate level um, in graduate school at Columbia, as well as teaching at Columbia. And so Emily Wapnick, you know, what she says is there's three skills that individuals who are multi-potentialites have. The first one is idea synthesis. So being able to take large volumes of information and condense it down for the book, I started off with about 1500 companies that I was looking at. And those companies were fast growing companies. And we defined fast growing based on a two year period of having double digit growth or during a one year period outperforming competitors if it was a stagnant market. And we looked at growth from the standpoint of revenue as well as user and customer base. Some of the companies that we were profiling were private companies. And so in all cases, we didn't have revenue data. And to no surprise, many of these companies are companies that would end up on Fast Company's most innovative companies list or CNBC's disruptors list um, or Brand Z in terms of world's most valuable companies. And so large volumes of data, that's kind of the first part. The second one is rapid learning. Um, that em Emily Wapnick tells us about. And with rapid learning, it involves really not only observation, which is that skill I had been exercising ever since uh, a child and teenager, but also the ability to obsess about something. <laughs> <laughs> and we know within the field of developing products for users, for communities, for different tribes, our ability to not only immerse and express a deep level of empathy towards a group, that's gonna help us obsess about that challenge. Um, and so I really obsessed about how to make this field that I fell in love with at the University of Chicago, behavioral economics, as accessible as it could mm. be, as repeatable and scalable as it could be. Because a lot of the research that we had coming out of Daniel Kahneman, Don Ariely, Richard Thaler, Cass Sunston, a number of other uh, pioneers within the field, they were based on experiments that they were right. doing, often on college campuses, right? And experimentation is key. It's part of that scientific method, right? We run experiments, I'm sure, at Google all the time in terms of EB test and what's the best type of um, environment to construct for someone digitally or on mobile devices. And so experimentation um, is quite key in, in the pursuit of rapid learning. And then that third skill that Emily talks about is adaptability. And so right now, in this current COVID-19 period, every brand has to be adaptable. Whether a company mm -hmm. had a playbook for business disruption, you know, maybe that was a playbook born out of the 1970s in terms of supply chain and oil spikes and kind of what happens um, when, when something that you need gets disrupted from a sustainability standpoint. Maybe that playbook is based on the 19, um, you know, uh, the kind of 1990s and some of the economic turmoil that we have there. Maybe it's based on 2001 and disruption within the travel industry that followed September 11th. And maybe it's based on the financial crisis of 2008 to 2010 mm. that kind of lingered on for a number of different years. Companies that have been around for decades, they benefit from that knowledge of how they operate it in the past. But that also can become an anchor that inhibits their growth. And so hmm. we now live in this digital time and the book 
and the method of scaling behavioral science um, was built for this digital period that we're in, where we literally, from a behavioral standpoint, are being rewired. And there are shortcuts to how we can activate emotions within our customers, within our consumer bases. And if we deploy those shortcuts, it doesn't take billions of dollars in order to create this value proposition. It doesn't take millions of dollars. It's something that every small business can do. It's really about understanding that you're marketing to a community and that's the major shift rather than trying to nail a one-to-one -one relationship that we may have done 10 years ago when the personalization era started. Um, now we're in the social period where brands that really take off, brands that grow faster than competitors, they do it because the community and the tribe around them helps to turbocharge the brand. So the philosophy is, was really getting us to this place of recognizing that business has to pivot because of the technology that has rewired the way that we interact with each other over the last decade. And in pivoting, we all must adopt new solutions that creates value in the world around us. So that was probably the general sense of how um, the book came about. Now, of course, there was failure along the way, right? And so I taught a course at Columbia to fill in a gap in 2017. Um, every couple of years, we deconstruct our program and we say, what do individuals need to learn, right? There's two types of learners that we have. We have learners that are right out of college, have about two to three years of experience. And then we have individuals that are um, experienced, seasoned professionals, 10 to 15 years um, under their belt. And they're coming back to maybe switch or pivot or elevate their um, current career to the next level. And so it needed to be a process, Fizz, that could work for both. Something mm -hmm. that taught someone um, about behavioral science and how to develop these strong communities in a way that didn't overwhelm individuals that were early in their career, but at the same time had enough substance for individuals that were more accelerated and advanced in their career, that it could be a tool that they would be proud to use. So that first year I bombed it failed. <laughs> it was not great. <laughs> and, you know, I can admit that in hindsight now. Now the course is in its fourth year. And for anyone who has ever taught anything new or developed a new process or idea, you expect that failure, right? You expect that there's going to be challenges. And that's what we're working through with that scientific method that we're using. And so there were a number of things that I learned about behavioral science. First, um, individuals are really fascinated by behavioral science, right? There's this kind of freakonomics interest in that field. And in 2017, I taught it in the spring and I was teaching about hundreds of cognitive biases that exist and students were having a really hard time figuring out a process in order to get to the same shared conclusion. One person would say, oh, I think these 30 biases are applying. Another person would say, I think these 18 biases are applying. And there was no consensus. And so I said, I need to develop a methodology, not just teach the subject of how you build brands with emotion, but teach a process of how you do that so it can become repeated. Um, later that year, in 2017, Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize in economics. And he won for his work in behavioral economics specifically. And he was an instructor at the University of Chicago in terms of Booth. And so I felt this sense of renewed energy. I took it as a sign. I said, you know what? I'm on the right path in terms of what should come next for brand building. As we live in this world where data is all around us and we can't lose sight of the community and the consumer that we're trying to influence in terms of how we're making them feel. And so um, I stuck with it. And now, uh, you know, in the fourth year, I think we got the process to a place where it works well for individuals that are entry level, individuals that are experienced. It works well across different categories and verticals, and it works great for B2C as well as B2B. 
Now, the next major thing that we have as a you know, kind of bridge is to figure out how to make it stretch from brands that are inanimate to brands that are people. And so I look forward to that next challenge of how we get individuals to follow the feeling from a personal branding standpoint also. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, I, I admire how how you can kind of talk about your your failure in such a kind of bold and proclaimed way. In my book, the most successful people in the world, they don't really lose, they learn because they are, they don't let their failures go to waste. They, uh, it was, it was uh, really cool to hear how you bounce back from that with those learnings. Now, in the process, you created a pretty simple framework, correct? Like, talk to us about the, the back of the napkin framework that you created. Yeah, absolutely. So in seeing whether it's students, and I've had hundreds of students over the years, or if it's clients and I have a dozen of those, everyone needs something that they can just visually wrap their head around that doesn't require a um, long explanation with a lot of different variables, this mathematical or statistical or psychological understanding as an underpinning. And so developing LeVec, which is a five-step process that helps brands figure out where to embed and engineer different heuristics, right? Shortcuts that's going to get us to feel some type of emotion. Um, you know, in developing that process, it was really important to um, develop one key visual. So that was the first part. Um, most of us in this session might be familiar with the work of Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, right? And his golden circle that he came out with oh, a decade ago. I modeled Levac as a process off of the simplicity of Simon Sinek's golden circle. Simon Sinek taught in the same graduate program um, as me before he developed the um, Golden Circle. And then he left the program after he released it and wrote his book and his TED Talk that went uh, famously wild, one of the most viewed TED Talks, right? One of the best business lessons that we can learn in terms of leadership and brand purpose. And he's inspired so many individuals to reevaluate how they were operating just from a leadership or employee standpoint. And so the visual was the first part, having something that was that simple, right? He focused on kind of those three areas um, within the golden circle. And I wanted to focus on something that was no more than five steps, incredibly simple. And wanted to make sure that it was something that worked globally. I grew up in Germany. I studied in Paris for part of college and have traveled to 20 different countries. And so for me, that element of being a global citizen and having a philosophy and a worldview that transcends geographies was very important. And when I started looking into how to make a system that translates well, emotions became very natural, right? Emotions control about 70 to 80% of our decisions, about 95% of our decisions as coded by Daniel Kahneman are made in autopilot. And the research that he did out of the 1970s and 80s that won him the Nobel Prize in 2002 was recently repeated by a group of researchers at Columbia in early 2020. And what they found is that, you know, we still are heavily operating autopilot. We're still heavily influenced by emotions. And there are strategic ways that we can get individuals to become motivated to make a certain choice um, and capable of making that choice also. So overcoming kind of two big hurdles that we see, um, whether someone is motivated or capable of making a decision. And so Levesque, was definitely a system born out of um, trial and error. And one of the things that I often say um, to individuals that I've worked with, and just as an insight from working, not only in the advertising agency world, we're coming up with a lot of creative products, but working in the music business. Um, before I joined Ogilvy, I worked for Diddy, 
where I ran communications for his television network and was on his launch team of his startup Revolt, and then worked for Troy Carter, a black venture capitalist. And we had a large portfolio of um, companies, about 80 companies, Uber, Lyft, Warby Parker, Spotify, Dropbox, that were all investments. And working across those different types of environments, wanted to make sure that, you know, Levesque as a system was accessible to the big brands that had big budgets, all the way down to the small businesses and entrepreneurs that are trying to start something um, from from off the ground with very little resources. And so that was a very important piece also is it didn't require a huge budget. It required creativity being applied strategically. Nice. Um, and uh, to help our, our, our audience visualize, I believe we have a, a visual. Here it is, LeFX. So yes. lexicon triggers, audio cues, visual stimuli, experience drivers, cultural connection. So this is your kind of five-step process for kind of following the feeling and creating that emotional connection between a brand and their tribe, so to speak. Uh, let's dive a bit deeper into the model. Uh, um, what do you mean by lexicon triggers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for putting up that visual. You know, I'm a visual learner, so it helps me to have kind of the anchoring orientation. And, you know, yeah, so let's let's dig in a little bit to bring this to life. Because I think once we discuss it, it's going to be something that individuals at any point can go to as a brainstorm technique. You know, I often use this when I'm stuck and I'm like, I just need a new idea and I need it right now, right? Kind of thinking on demand is not always the easiest thing to do. And so these are some shortcuts that fast growing companies have used. Um, the first area in terms of lexicon is probably the most used um, and suggested from a Google standpoint and product standpoint, right? We think about lexicon, that's all the words that we're using. Think of the keywords and SEO, and we know that you have to have this great breadcrumb in order to help individuals get to the right information if you're a business owner, right? Find your products and services. That was why it was important for me to name it Follow the Feeling, something mm -hmm. that's easy to understand from an alliteration standpoint. And it took me a year, Fizz, in order to get the URL, followthefeeling.com. But I know- I'm glad you got it. <laughs> <laughs> I know the importance of good SEO, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the URL. And with the Lexicon, about seven, percent of communication when we look at it from an audio visual standpoint about seven percent it are the words that we use the a large majority is the visuals that we see the symbols for instance body language gestures and then the delivery style of that are we using humor are we saying something from a um, authoritarian um, standpoint also and so words are and i may be bold in saying this but the least important part of communication. When you think about the visual spectrum of what you can say, however, words are the things a lot of brands hyper fixate on. They spend a significant amount of time figuring out a tagline, figuring out a positioning statement or value proposition, um, and also figuring out what their brand mission is and purpose is. They spend so much time focusing on those words that sometimes they don't get to the actual living of those words or bring into life of those words from an operational or supply chain or hiring or retention um, or even just a philanthropic standpoint. And so I wanna really encourage individuals as we think about these pivots that we have to make to strengthen our business, um, to de-emphasize words and to really figure out what are the two to three choiceful words that you're going to own or phrases? And I'll give you kind of two examples. Um, in and out Burger, which anyone who's on the West Coast that may be joining us, uh, it's one of my favorite chains. They're by no means the biggest. They are um, able to punch above their weight class with McDonald's because they have taken the process of ordering, which is a very mundane process. You know, anyone who's been a drive through, it's kind of the same, uh, you know, same type of process. So they've taken a mundane moment in a journey 
and they have elevated it into something that is memorable and ownable by creating their own branded vocabulary. In that vocabulary, whether you're ordering something that's animal style or double double, it makes you feel as if you are part of a community, you're part of their tribe. It's like a knock on the door of a speakeasy, right? You say the right things in order to get the results or in order to get, to get in. And so it's really just kind of badging and mirroring that's happening from a community standpoint. And we find the brands that have the strongest relationships with their audiences they don't treat them like a target audience. They treat them like a community. And they understand that that community has a lexicon that matters within that select group. So it's really about immersing and understanding enough or looking at social media, looking at Google Trends or looking at whatever data you can find in order to figure out what is really that um, language that's going to make that community feel as if they are part of something when they use it right? Use it as, as, as badges. Um, give you one more quick example, Southwest Airlines. And we all have heard the same pre-flight safety instructions, right? Most individuals put their headphones in um, or they start reading something in front of them, but they kind of tune out. And for frequent travelers, it's kind of a, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it's me because I'm on a, uh, generally on a plane a couple of times a month, um, you know, when we could normally travel. Um, but it's kind of something you can recite back even after a certain period of time. And so people tune it out. And what we have to really figure out with lexicon is how do we get people to not tune out what we're saying, but to feel as if it is um, being signaled directly to them. And so Southwest, as I mentioned, it's the words, um, it's visuals in terms of communication, but it's also the delivery style. That's what makes communications overall. Southwest focuses on delivery style, right? And in delivery style, they use humor. And by empowering their stewards to um, apply that delivery device of humor, they're able to create this communal effect with passengers laughing and kind of having this shared experience right from the beginning of the, of the flight. And so it really reinforces community building um, components in terms of how do individuals relate and connect and talk to each other. Awesome, great example. So man, you may be hungry with that in and out burger <laughs> <laughs> case study. Uh, I, I wish they had in and out burger in New York. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll pick it up next time I'm in, I'm in California. Um, you know, in your book, you also emphasize the importance of audio cues. You know, who are some brands that do audio cues exceptionally well? Yeah, well, I'll probably go to the go-to example, Fizz, which is Intel, right? Intel, they unveiled their famous bong chimes in 1994. And for anyone who is a music fan like me. That is the year that Whitney Houston ruled and was winning Grammys left and right, especially for, um, you know, I Will Always Love You. And so um, if you if you trace or track history based on music, that's kind of what was going on back then. But when they released those bongs in 1994, um, they really didn't have a sense of how valuable that would become as a brand asset. It's always a risk. Because what we find in research is that about 80% of brands are not identifiable by a single audio tone. And so audio becomes one of the lowest hanging fruits <laughs> of the tree that um, someone can invest in in order to get an outsized impact back. When it comes to Intel, those bongs played in the world about every three seconds. And as a product, um, it is one of the most recognizable um, chips, and that sound was one of the most recognizable um, sounds that were trademarked amongst any brands. Yet, how many people have held an Intel chip in their hand, right? Probably less than 1% of individuals. And so I, I like the example of Intel because it doesn't preclude that you have this tangible tactile relationship with the product. It doesn't require that you even see the product physically. Um, it's really about the consistency of using audio 
And one of the things that we know is fastest growing within audio right now is voice and the power of voice. And we've reached this, you know, we've kind of crossed this tech chasm in smart speakers, right? And so, you know, I think 2021 will probably be the year that half of U.S. households have a smart speaker and at least one. I think we're at a place where a lot of households have multiple, right? We're kind of just wiring different rooms, kind of a total home um, ecosystem that that's digitally connected. And so with smart speakers, voice is the next big fight that brands have to get accustomed to. We see this in the car with hands-free, with individuals driving. We see this um, at home and in a number of different places as people are on the go with different watches and the way that individuals are searching based on voice right now. And so the brands that lean forward into audio um, are going to have a, a huge ROI. But Fizz, I'll, I'll be remiss, you know, anytime I speak, I try to make sure that I give someone at least one technique that they can use. So I want to leave you with one technique related to audio. Sarah. Is thinking of the three things audio does really well. So if you're saying, how can I kind of brainstorm around audio and where this can make sense for, for someone's brand? Um, the first one is audio is great at creating a mood or shifting a mood. So if you think about what's that mindset that someone's in, right? Apps like Calm have done so well in the app store, whether it's app of the year or the most downloaded app, or whether it's partnerships that they're doing, bringing in other voices of prominent individuals. I think now LeBron James and Diddy are both like uh, have meditation <laughs> guides that we do for audio. And so it's not just books, you know, that we're seeing um, this reinvention. Um, it's not just voice. I know Google, um, you know, Home has done things with John Legend and other kind of voices. Um, but it's also all those interesting ways that the brand can be brought to life from a, from a voice standpoint. So mood is one, right? You think of the Muzak that's on an elevator. Um, that That's one instant mood shifter. What's in a restaurant that's playing? What's playing in a um, uh, grocery store or retail environment? You know, the mood is one. Um, message is another. And so often we may associate this with voice, often with transit. For instance, anyone who's missing the subway or missing traveling, this walkway is ending, right? All those kind of voice cues um, are, are important. And then the third, other than mood and message, is behavior. And there's certain tones, whether it is a you know, microwave beeping, an oven beeping, a doorbell, a washing machine, or something else going off, we are trained behaviorally to pay attention to those sound heuristics. We can engineer those heuristics into different products, um, whether they're digital or physical. Um, you know, think of turning on a video game console, right? Thinking of opening a computer. Um, there's a number of experiences and brain interactions that we have in which audio sets up the context, as well as helps us differentiate when we're multitasking um, in the world and may not be be looking at the screen. So I'll challenge everyone, you know, even, even the Google team, right? If you were to close your eyes and think of how someone can identify your brand with audio alone, would you pass that test? And that's the challenge that a lot of brands have to ask themselves in this new reality is, would you pass that Santa Sonic branding test? Wow. Yeah, those are some really, really strong points towards the end. Uh, and as you're kind of describing those sounds, I was automatically mentally visualizing some of those moments, kind of the, the shortcuts that my brain is creating for myself. Um, so talking about visuals, let's continue on the Levec journey. You also really talk about visual stimuli. Um, why is that important and how does that fit into the first two points that we just discussed? Yeah, well, visuals are important because when we look at consumer behavior uh, and we look at the way that individuals communicate through text message and the way individuals communicate through social media posts, those two modes of communication, which are primarily how individuals are using a lot of their like smart devices or tablets, right? In addition to learning and in addition to entertainment, um, they are also using them as modes of communication. And so when we look at those two, about 25 to 30% of um, intrapersonal communications have some type of visual included. And that becomes huge. And so when we think about what those visuals are, it may be an image, 
it may be an emoji, it may be a GIF. And as brands, many individuals have yet to evolve their brand guidelines to include these newer modes of communication. We did a piece of research um, in, in terms of getting ready for the book two years ago. And we looked at dictionaries because our ration was dictionaries are the codes of communities. And if we can look and see what types of dictionaries are emerging and which dictionaries are growing the fastest, then we can start to understand what pieces of um, uh, visuals or visual stimuli brands need to create, not only to have that one-to-one -one relationship, but again, help community members or people in the tribe around your brand to talk to each other. And so what we found um, was that in, in terms of those dictionaries, the fastest growing modes were not words, right? We have dictionaries from the 1800s, whether it's Merriam-Webster, Oxford dictionaries. Every year, there's only about a thousand new words that are added, right? It wasn't until 2015 that the Oxford word of the year was emoji. And it wasn't until 2014 that Twitter added emojis. And so within the last five years, we've had two major forms of communication emerge. We've had emojis, we've had GIFs. And I was you know, pretty surprised in 2018 when Alex Chung, Giphy's um, founder, um, gave a South by Southwest keynote. And in it, he released a stat, which is in the early year of 2018, by March of that year, Giphy as an app and digital platform was doing one tenth of the search volume as Google. And that created a pause for me because we know how often individuals are searching for Google off, uh, on Google um, uh, search across, you know, generally multiple times a, a day even. So to, to understand that we're shifting towards this compression of knowledge is very important for brands in, in how they release information and talk um, about their different products. Because people are returning to hieroglyphics. We're returning to emojis, we're returning to glyphs. Um, and we used to reason, well, individuals, kind of whether it is um, in Egypt or other kind of times and civilizations, how much can a hieroglyphic actually say? And what we realize now is they can actually say a lot. The right emoji in the midst of a conversation is everything, right? It's it's life. The right meme, the right um, gif, it can convey more than you can put into words even. It it transmits a mood and a feeling, you know, instantly. And so most brands have some work that they have to do in terms of figuring out how do they construct an ecosystem so that their brand is chunked into smaller pieces so individuals in the community can help share it and that brand can be a facilitator of conversation rather than um, just trying to maximize against reach and repetition of one-way messages. And I saw this very commonly within the music industry. If you look across social platforms, the most followed accounts generally are music artists. Um, usually it's seven out of 10 top ones are you know, probably uh, a music artist. Now the challenge is a music artist never has the time, just like a brand, to go and message everyone from a volume standpoint who may be talking about them. And so years ago, as I was working on um, the management team for Megan Trainer, one of the things that we started to see when emojis started to get big, she started to use emojis often. And in 2015, she started to develop this way of communicating with ease and quite frequently with um, the Megatrons based on heavy usage of emojis. And so certain brands, whether you're a person, um, whether you are an entity or a nonprofit, you have the opportunity to think what is my audience going to talk to each other about? And then how does the brand show up in terms of visual artifacts so individuals can have a passive experience when they're in the midst of those natural conversations and a third of the time looking for some form of expression to share? That's fascinating. You know, I I've never thought about Giphy as a, in terms of a dictionary, and I've never thought about memes and GIFs as, as hieroglyphs modern day digital hieroglyphics uh that's that's you're absolutely right uh so we've talked about l a and v in the Lebec model and we just have a couple more uh, letters uh to discuss here 
Uh, uh, talk to us. So E was experience drivers, correct? So how do you talk to brands and individuals about experience drivers? Yeah, sure. So when it comes to that first three areas, lexicon, audio, and visuals, those are the building blocks of communication. Every communication has the ability strategically to have those things or recognize those three things, right? So the whole process of Levesque is based on um, systems-based thinking, which originates with Donella Meadows, who is a, a MacArthur Fellow and former MIT researcher who wrote a book, Thinking in Systems, which is Pulitzer um, 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 recognized. Um, I don't think she won the Pulitzer, but um, it's nominated for it. And um, she is the predecessor for sustainability, right? A lot of the research that she's done out in the 1970s now informs supply chain, now informs environmentalism, but at the end of the day is all about resiliency. So Levesque was built so that brands could be resilient over time, regardless of what the economic conditions are that's happening. And so in that systems-based thinking, those kind of elements or building blocks are lexicon, audio, and visuals. When all of those elements clash and merge and interact with each other, that forms some type of brand expression, right? Could be a video game, could be an ad, could be an in-store experience. Um, but what we're trying to do from a strategic standpoint is always think, what are those three levels um, that we have to reinforce from a communication standpoint? The experience, um, to say it, uh, I think, quite succinctly, is all about driving a normative behavior, a custom, a ritual, or a tradition that the community can do with each other around your product, right? So it may be if you're Glossier, it may mean giving feedback and helping kind of co-develop and build what that next new product is going to be. Um, if it is a, um, you know, a, a beauty brand, it might mean using the product, such as a face pill, putting it on, taking a picture, posting it in social media, and that's the way that you're badging. So we have these natural opportunities, not only for consumers to use the product and get the value themselves or for their families, um, but how do you use the product in a way that has meaning for the community? that you're a part of. So it's specifically looking at the brand and saying, what ritual can I drive among community members that really love this product? Something that they can do with each other. Awesome, love that. Yeah, making a product a ritual. Uh, at Google, we, we call it the uh, toothbrush test. So I, I can definitely resonate to that. All right, I'm going to ask you just one final question before we shift to a few audience questions. So the last part of Levesque is cultural connection. Now, keeping in mind that we're in 2020, the year of coronavirus and heightened racial unrest, do brands tiptoe around these issues or ignore them? And you know, on the contrary, if they choose to embrace them, how do they avoid sounding cliche, insensitive, or tone deaf? Uh, talk to us about how you discuss cultural connection with the brands that you work with. Yeah, that's a really great question, Fizz, because when we're operating within this speedway of culture, the last thing a brand wants to do is enter it or exit it incorrectly. And that you know brings up a lot of questions around brand safety and how can a brand be present in the moment, acknowledge the moment, um, but do it in a way that um, does not upset or put off the audience or community that they've invested um, in, in building around them. And so there are um, three steps that I would recommend to individuals, um, team leaders, um, organization, um, boards, and C-suite individuals that are really looking for something simple that they can remember and do in terms of how to get involved in um, what's happening in the world right now, how to have a stance and figure out what are you going to stand for as an organization, right? Every organization, I think, needs to really figure out what they're willing to stand for. And the three things when you're involving taking a stand that involves a community or marginalized group or someone else 
who you're doing something on behalf of, right? So there's a lot of brands. We looked at this um, three, three months ago in June. They made proclamations and declarations around Black Lives Matter and supporting um, the Black community, whether it is business owners or whether it's their own employees, but making some type of show of solidarity. Some posted Black squares on their social feeds, others really statements. Um, I tracked about 85 major companies from Diageo to Nordstrom to Levi's that all made public statements. The majority of them came from a C-suite executive. Um, the majority of them involved a donation or some type of uh, monetary give back. And when you look compared to the brands that have just spoken up um, and even signed Stop Hate for Profit, right? A thousand companies that did that. We have this kind of mass mobilization of brands in 2020 that really didn't exist over the last couple of years. And so when you think of, you know, in 2000 and um, 13, Black Lives Matter as an organization was launched officially. The hashtag was first used in 2012 related to Trayvon Martin's death. Alicia Garza posted on Facebook. Um, two other um, Black women who are her co-founders then joined her in amplifying it, right? Black Lives Matter was founded by three Black women. Um, and I think it's important to, to note that because the narrative often changes into what it represents that it did not initially maybe represent, which was really this call to action from a um, community leaders and activists um, for um, everyone to have their role in terms of accountability as a citizen um, and then as, as major companies and as institutions such as um, the, the legal system and the, the law um, and in terms of being, being fair for, for police and criminal justice and a number of different things, right? So that's the culture that's happening at large around us, right? This move for racial equity, this move for equity in general, whether it's gender and pay equity, um, whether it's LGBTQ, it's really just equity. And recognizing that some individuals feel as if they don't have what other individuals have. And so as brands, right, we have employees and we want to encourage those employees to have a great quality of life outside of work, to bring that into a work environment so they can be as productive as possible. And that means brands have to acknowledge and often not be inactive. A lot of brands are gonna find themselves doing something, maybe for the first time or maybe doubling down, you know, and taking a kind of firmer stance. And so as brands attempt, I think, to jump into culture and to be a part of um, all the issues that are happening right now, um, we have to treat communities fair because communities risk losing more in some cases than brands risk losing, right? So for a big brand to put a million dollars behind a campaign, you know, they may lose a, you know, a lot uh, less than if a community doesn't actually solve that issue that's being portrayed in that advertising or communication. So there's three things, there are three E's that I would recommend anyone who is writing a creative brief, anyone who's on a philanthropy team figuring out who to support, anyone who's in PR figuring out what messaging to give executives for visibility, um, and anyone who's a leader of a team trying to give them guidance. These are the three E's that you should pay attention to. Um, empathy. Are you respecting the community by amplifying the voices that matter most to them? Right. And often we don't do this with creative briefs, right? We build a product sometimes, but we may not bring the community in until we're in user testing. Why don't we bring the community in when we're in ideation, right? So that product can be built in the beginning, whether that product is a piece of software, is an app, or a communication, right? We kind of treat this language of product kind of pretty loosely, but it's bringing the right voices in early in the process, not just in the validation or late stages. Um, so that then the technology doesn't go awry, right? We don't have um, kind of the encoded biases that we probably could have avoided. Um, the second E is empowerment. We have to make sure that communities are better off if you are talking about some type of social issue. So I love that all of these brands jumped in and said, we're committing, you know, 
um, you know, media space in order to um, run and represent this message. We're donating money. We're allowing people to volunteer. We're creating a grant program for um, small businesses. Um, it's very, very important to make sure that the community has an outsized impact in, in terms of effect than your own PR, right? So any company that's going into it and saying, I gotta support Black Lives Matter and I need to make sure that I get credit for it and we do a whole campaign based on it, those are the wrong intentions. And so you have to do it with the standpoint of um, how do I make it about the community and how do I solve their issues? So you're not just showing imagery of protests. We don't need to see imagery of protest to know there's protests. We need the issues that people are protesting to be addressed. And so that's the space that brands need to jump into is not just amplifying um, what is happening, but getting closer to the solutions. And the last area is earnestness. You know, a lot of organizations and leaders right now, they want to do well. They have good intentions, but they don't have the track record. So they don't necessarily know the impact that they're going to have or um, what the steps are they should go through. And so I'll caution a lot of individuals when it comes to earnestness to make sure that you're solving issues that the community you're representing or putting in you know, those communications or saying you know, we're helping you know, um, this group of individuals do something, you have to make sure you're solving the problem that they ask you to solve for. Um, I'll give an example of real estate, what's happening right now. I just think this is funny. No slight against anyone who's a real estate agent. Um, but we've had kind of this language like master, right? And blacklist and other things. And maybe we can talk about the blacklist 100 and uh, kind of the, the, the funny things that happen when now we have these terms that individuals are saying are not terms we should use anymore. They shouldn't be used in coding. They shouldn't be used quite, quite broadly because they... Um, kind of skew society in a certain way. Well, real estate agents had decided maybe we should start um, or rather stop naming a master bedroom a master bedroom. <laughs> um, you know, and granted that has psychological context in terms of history, that notion of master, but it also has a lot of functional benefit in terms of just knowing which room is the biggest one. The issue as a black community that we need solved is not the fact that a master bedroom is named a master bedroom. That is not the issue to solve. The issue to solve is equality in general. Um, and so again, brands can go down a wrong path if they say, let me just invent something that we can be doing um, in this moment of time so that we don't have inaction. And that can actually be harmful. And so an earnestness means asking the community what issues they need solved and committing to solving those issues in a substantive way or making a substantive impact. Is one brand gonna solve all racial inequity? No, but can one brand impact one geographic community? Maybe, can they impact one group of individuals um, as a hyper niche, maybe? And so, you know, again, the goal is solve the things that people ask you to solve or validate upfront that what you're investing in on behalf of a community is what that community actually wants. All right, uh, in, in the last few minutes we have, let's jump into some audience questions. Uh, if we could get some of those up on the screen. All right, with so many influencers, brands and social media, how do you see this evolving in the future? Influencer, Influencer marketing, marketing. Yeah, well, well. My hope with influencer marketing is that we will evolve to a place where influencers are treated less as a media buy and more as creative directors and inputs up front. And so I think we have to change the ordering in which we think of um, these different influencers. Um, when we try to reach communities, arguably the individuals that know a community best are the influencers. They're in that community on a day-to-day -day basis. They're de facto community managers. And so when we leave their insight to the very end, and we would see this often, right? We represent music talent. Sometimes a brand has a fully baked campaign. They come to us and they're like, oh, can this artist 
you know, do something related to it. Would have been much better off had that artist or someone from the artist community in general been involved in the brainstorming process, been involved in the strategy process. And so um, as we think about the future of influencers and the future of community-based marketing, we really have to make sure that they're getting a seat at the table up front. And that's going to solve a couple of different challenges, including a challenge around lack of representation. And so the last thing a brand wants to do is recognize that its team may not be as diverse and reflective as the society that it's creating communication and engagement for, make assumptions based on data with no validation of immersion or bringing in someone that can represent that community. That has a lot of brand risk. Brands have been able to get away with that in the past, but now there's a heightened sense of transparency around who's making these decisions, who is actually writing the brief, right? And ensuring that there's diversity all along the way. And so the more influencers are brought in early, the less they're treated like a media buy on the back end, um, the closer a community is going to get pulled into a brand because that community is going to realize that they actually have representation. Awesome. Next question. How can we adapt our practice of these brand building principles while keeping accessibility in mind? Mm. So I think we may have to uh, may have to qualify or talk a little bit about the word accessibility. Um, so in terms of accessibility, I'm gonna so, define that as um, meaning if you're doing something and it's on behalf of a community that it doesn't alienate or isolate other individuals that might not be in that community. So I'm, I'm going to preclude that. Accessibility means, for instance, if you're using audio, um, it is something that um, anyone can come across, but it may have more meaning to, to one group, or if you're creating assets that um, someone can find them um, quite easily. So, you know, the, the way that I'll say in terms of um, accessibility is, um, you know, think of the ice bucket challenge in ALS. And I think that example is a really great one that involves emotion and a normative behavior and accessibility and is um, one of the reasons why it took off, right? And so it took some very common elements that everyone had all around them um, in terms of a pail, water, ice, yeah, friends or people in a network. Um, and that was really the core components. Now, the reason they did that challenge is because, you know, the, the feeling um, uh, in terms of ALS is one that, you know, the sense of kind of numbness um, that's created in the body. And so that kind of cold um, kind of ice bath mimicked that feeling that someone would have if they're actually having it, not nearly um, equal, right? Um, if, if you have it, but it gave a temporary sensation at least. And so it was a um, campaign and a brand that was catapulted into the spotlight because of that easy, accessible, normative behavior that anyone can do. And so when we talk about community-based marketing, it doesn't mean that every single message isn't necessarily going to be, you know, understood by an audience, um, you know, but it does mean we're trying to um, hyper-personalize to, you know, not necessarily to an individual, but to that mass psyche. And that's the kind of main difference that we should be thinking about in terms of accessibility is um, that we're trying to tap into this, the shared collective group dynamism um, of a community rather than an individual um, individual person. person. And when we think about how many people have to start to take an action or share something in order for the rest of the community members to pay attention, Research shows it's about 5 to 15%. And so in terms of accessibility, I think about it from the standpoint of how many people do I have to get to start taking an action 
or to start doing something that can seed it with the rest of the community that will then help whatever that language or audio or other cues might be diffuse in what we find from research standpoint it's about five to fifteen percent right we call those people sometimes early adopters now one is a psychology model and one is um just a model based on kind of the you know the um, kind of tech chasm and work of jeffrey moore and how innovation diffuses and so we um, you know from a strategic standpoint um, I would really focus accessibility on that early group and then a second wave of accessibility around kind of general population in terms of how does something become just mass pragmatic. So you may be working from one insight around the community, like this community really loves this kind of music. This is what this music means to this group that may get you those early individuals in terms of accessibility. Um, but then, you know, there may be some pivot to start to bring other people, other communities into the fold also. Awesome, I love that Ice Bucket Challenge uh, example. Very insightful there. Um, with that, we are at time for today. Uh, Kai, I want to thank you for the generosity of your time and the super insightful conversation. And I want to thank everyone who attended the live stream yeah. today. Thank you so much, Fizz. And if anyone wants to follow me on LinkedIn or jump on Twitter and put in follow the feeling, the hashtag, I think maybe I'll give away some books, Fizz. And so <laughs> feel free, uh, let's say the first 10 people that follow me on LinkedIn um, and a couple of individuals that tweet out follow the feeling as a hashtag. And I hope that this session has inspired everyone, whether you are an executive, an employee, or an entrepreneur, to really think about how your brand is showing up in this moment in time and how your community is interacting with each other and the role that your brand can play in really creating strong turbocharged communities and tribes.